if I can do that because I am trying. I don't know if I can actually move this slide because I'm being blocked from. Oh, there it is. Great. Okay. So when you say move, do you want me just to minimize it? No, it's okay. Oh, <laughs> Está bien, así, Marcela. Or Bueno, buenas tardes a todos, buenos días, buenas noches. Le damos la bienvenida a esta charla del Asimi Club de eSports y Videojuegos. Mi nombre es Alonso Fabricio Módica y me toca estar como coordinador. La verdad que qué mejor que empezar el Asimi Club de Videojuegos invitando a una figura, o mejor dicho, la figura de videojuegos, que es David Brinsman, abogado experto en propiedad intelectual y videojuegos, quien... Who will talk about uh, the state of the industry. It's going to be a very comprehensive talk, so please pay attention. Unfortunately, we won't have time for a Q&A session, but please send it to us and we'll see how we can respond. For those of you who don't know David, let me introduce him very briefly. He was involved in the business of video games for more than 25 years. He's worked independently in legal, um, um, including S Sony and uh, um, and for Thai Banco. Even though he is terrible. Uh, playing video games. He has uh, been involved in all the aspects in the development uh, and uh, the marketing of uh, video games, and he has negotiated hundreds of uh, agreements uh, covering those areas. He has also uh, um, uh, represented uh, uh, major game developers, distributors, motion picture studios, professional sport leagues, uh, television networks. At Bandai, he put together a deal where Pac-Man was featured in a television commercial seen by over 145 million people during uh, the uh, Super Bowl in 2015. Mr. Greenpan is the lead author of the white publication entitled Mastering the Game, Business and Legal Issues for Video Game Developers. He's currently working on the second edition with a project at release in early 2021. He has also written law articles about uh, antitrust issues involving American college uh, football broadcasts and U.S. film rating system. Well, his uh, resume is quite long, but without further ado, I'll, uh, uh, let's listen to him. He's going to talk uh, about uh, the video games. So, David, go ahead. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias por esa presentación, aunque no entendí porque era en español. Uh, muchas gracias por permitirme eh, hablarles. Eh, los saludo desde Silicon Valley en California. Les voy a hablar de una serie de temas diferentes en la próxima hora y me voy a concentrar en las tendencias y qué es lo que está pasando en la industria. Y talk about uh, streaming, which is somewhat not a new concept, but has really exploded just within the last few years. And this is a different type of streaming than streaming a Netflix movie, but this is more about community and people watching people play. And it has become a billion dollar industry uh, as part of the big picture in the video game industry. So the reason why I have this seatbelt is uh, buckle up and we'll see how much we can cover in the next hour. And I'm gonna start by providing some numbers for the industry. Uh, unfortunately, because of the coronavirus, the numbers have uh, exceeded the expectations that were predicted at the beginning of the year because obviously people are staying home and they've decided that video games has been probably the number one form of entertainment at home. And so therefore the numbers have really climbed. But when you look at these numbers, they are incredible numbers that have been reached in a relatively short period of time for a number of reasons, which we'll discuss within the next hour. So 
New Zoo, which is one is probably the most popular research organization in the industry, reported $148.8 billion in revenue in 2019. And 2020, it looks as if we will break those numbers and it's projected to hit 159. However, I don't know whether that was done with the knowledge that the virus would actually last this long. So this report was done in May, and I project that those numbers will probably be higher than 159 billion. 2023 projected to reach $200 billion. And this exceeds film, book, TV, theater, music, also uh, sports-related entities. So again, incredible success in a short period of time. And if you look at a time frame in 95 when PlayStation was first introduced in the United States, it was introduced in Japan in 94. The worldwide market was about US $4.3 billion. And at that time, that was considered a pretty good amount of money. It was dominated by Nintendo and Sega. In 2007, it jumped to $35 billion. And that was with the introduction of the iPhone, but it wasn't until a little later that the iPhone really changed the industry. In 2017, revenue was about $108 billion. And since 95, an increase of roughly 3,300% in 25 years. But there's a caveat to that. That's assuming that my math is correct. So that's taking a big risk. So the film industry, in comparison to the video game industry, in 2019, the film industry had its most successful year, reaching $101 billion. That number has dropped considerably as a result of the virus, and it may take the film industry years to get back to that number. Book publishing, the global market estimated to be worth about 119 in 2019. Some have reported 143. So that number is pretty big, but again, Uh, the video game industry has surpassed it. And then the music industry is at 21.5 billion in 2019, and they have taken a tremendous hit because of the inability to actually have live concerts, and much of the artist's revenue is generated from live concerts. So interesting enough, we're going to see a little later that there's a video game called Fortnite, which now actually incorporates concerts in the games, and it's been incredibly successful. So another comparison that I like to do is to professional sports leagues, because they get a lot of publicity, and most people think that they generate incredible amounts of money, and they do. But yet you can see the numbers also very small. And all, and in addition, the numbers are going to be smaller for 2020, which is in contrast to the video game industry. And interesting enough, the NBA, for example, their biggest licensing outside of television broadcast was a deal that they did with Take-Two for for, I'm looking at my chart, $1 billion in 2019 for exclusive rights. And then to be fair, here are some other leagues, FIFA, Uh, The Football Association, $770 million in 2019, assuming that is accurate. And then EA paid FIFA $160 million in royalties in 2017, which shows the incredible success of that franchise, the EA FIFA game, which is the most successful franchise in the world. And then there's the Premier League, and that was coming in at about two, about $7.1 billion in 2018-2019. Again, yeah, a lot, yeah, again, 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 broadcast revenue. So I also like to reference two very popular games. They illustrate trends in the industry. And one of the games is Grand Theft Auto V. You may have heard of it, but even back in 2013, the game earned $800 million within 24 hours. And that was considered extraordinary. Sold more than 11 million copies of the retail version within three days. To date, it has sold 115 million copies, the most successful entertainment property uh, in the world. Uh, And then there's the comparison for Iron Man 3 when it was released in 2013, where the revenue for that was 372 million in its first weekend, which was extraordinary numbers, but didn't even come close to the numbers of Grand Theft Auto. So this game has been on the market for seven years, and yet it still continues to have tremendous success. And it earned in 2019 $595 million. And admittedly, I'm sure Hollywood would love to have a movie that 
and came out seven years ago and is still able to maintain incredible amounts of money. And it's unlike any other industry where the video game in industry can do this. And one of the reasons is through continuing to update the games and it's through digital distribution. So the games now have longer life cycles. They continue to make money and that's been obviously very, very successful. Oh, one thing I want to point out with the numbers, when I indicated that the numbers uh, were predicted to be about 159 billion, it has been reported that the first three quarters of the year, at least for the United States, pretty much broke records for the amount of income that came in. It was about $11 billion for the first and second quarter. The first quarter was a record. Uh, the third quarter was about $10 billion, and those are increases from, it, from about 30% from the previous year. And those are traditional time periods where there's not necessarily the most selling or sales of video game revenue. So you saw uh, a, a big up. Uh, uptick in, in revenue. Another game that if you're parents, you may have heard of, it's called Fortnite. This game has made billions of dollars in a relatively short period of time. How do they do it? It's a free game and they do it by what's called microtransactions. So they sell things in the game. They can be as little as 99 cents. They can be as high as maybe a hundred dollars or even more. And they also provide additional content, and this is the way in which games are making money as a result of the free-to-play business model. Uh, it made $2.4 billion in 2018, which was the most ever for a game. It continued to do extremely well in 2019. I assume the numbers will even be better in 2020. It was reported just last week that it is expected that Epic will make about $5 billion this year, which is the developer of the game. Now, granted, Epic is also involved in many other things, so how much is tied to Fortnite is unknown. It, it has not only attracted an incredible amount of people for this game, you can see, and also a lot of people are watching others play the game. And this is an important note regarding numbers because we're going to get back to it later. Uh, in the United States, well, 1.2 billion earned by iOS, which is Apple. Uh, and Apple made $360 million from licensing fees. And the reason why this is important is because Epic is currently in a lawsuit with Apple. And the game has actually been pulled from the Apple site. And you can see how much money is at stake for just this one particular property. Uh, in addition to selling uh, microtransactions and, con and other content, uh, there was a live in-concert event uh, by the performer Marshmallow, watched by 10 million people who logged into the game. So you have this audience that is kind of a captive audience, and they can watch the concert. And at the time, it was the largest audience for any concert in, in the world. And soon that was surpassed when Travis Scott's 10 Minutes concert had 27.7 million unique viewers. Now, granted, that was over a, a few days, but still, the numbers are astronomical and what that does for the artists it not only obviously gets the music in front of a lot of people but they're hoping that they can actually sell additional merchandise future concerts etc cetera, etc cetera. so where is this revenue being split up among the territories and asia is by far the biggest market and includes china japan south korea china goes back and forth with the united states as number one in revenue japan clearly number three that's where the video game industry pretty much grew out of with Sony, Nintendo, uh, South Korea, it, surprisingly to many people, is fourth, but that's because they're very high tech and they also very big into esports uh, in South Korea. So the market projected to generate $78.4 billion, representing 50% of the worldwide market. Uh, China, China's market obviously dominating, and you can see the numbers. Uh, for those countries. And what's not included is really India, which has a population over a billion people, yet has really not drawn the attention of a lot of people in the video game industry. They have incredibly talented developers, but uh, from a consumer market, it has yet to grow, but I'm assuming that that will eventually take off. 
And then North America, second biggest market, represents 25%, also uh, tremendous uh, development community. Europe at 30 billion, slowing down, but still draws tremendous revenue, slowing down in the sense that people don't necessarily see it as big growth, but that's because it already has achieved 30 billion. Again, very big in development, uh, not only in Western Europe, but also Eastern Europe. And if you include uh, Russia, also a pretty good development community. Latin America generated about six billion, but there's hope, uh, greater bandwidth capacity and, and growing gaming population. So many people see that as a growing market. Mexico, Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia round off the top four in revenue and also in development. And the Middle East and Africa, which has really never received much attention at all in the video game space, will generate about $5.4 billion and will grow about 14.5%. Now, this was predictions prior to the virus, so I assume that the virus could be slowing certain things down, but at the same time, it may also bring about some revenue if people are on their phones. And here's a breakdown uh, of the revenue, and we'll skip past that. That's that's Latin America. And so how do games make money? So the traditional way has been what's called premium. You charge a certain amount of dollars for a particular game. You go to the store, you buy it at retail, or you can download the game and pay a certain amount of price. Interesting enough, the premium price for video games has been pretty much the same for the last 10, 12 years. I anticipate that that price will slightly go up only because development costs have also gone up. Uh, the free-to-play model, which is the, probably the primary model now for most games, especially if it's digitally downloaded or on a mobile device, and that originated many years ago because the field was so competitive, so many games. How does a developer distinguish one game from another, especially the small smaller developers, and so they came up with a free-to-play model. They vary on what's, what is, in fact, free and what you do have to pay for, but primarily you can play the game for free, get to many levels, so forth and so on, and then if you want to either get new items or what's called power-up, which allows you to speed up, Maybe we'll power up during this conversation, uh, and you pay for that service. And then what's becoming very attractive for many companies is something called a games as a service. And think of it, unfortunately, as when you download software, instead of buying the software and having it uh, perpetually, now you get you license the software for about a year, you pay X amount of dollars, and then you have to renew. And that's what's happening with some of the video games. And it may be the direction that we're going because of a number of factors, one being that it makes money, and two, it reduces the cost for developers substantially because they don't have to deal with retail. And what happens in this particular situation is that the video games uh, provide, the video game developers provide content on a continuing basis. And you pay X amount of dollars per month. Maybe you have a year yearly subscription for that. So the game's always being updated. And another good thing for video game companies is that they don't necessarily have to develop a sequel, which is going to be very expensive, but they rely on the initial game and they just continually update it and update it. And these cycles can go on for a very long time. And EA reported that about 45% of their revenue from 2019 came from games as service. So that's going to be the new business model for many companies. Also, there's the potential growth of subscription services, uh, very much like Netflix, but that's still out there in the sense that whether it succeeds or not, some companies have been doing it, and then there are more that are going to get into the space. It's all going to come down to whether there's good content with these particular services that would be enough for a consumer to want to uh, pay X amount of dollars to be part of that service. Other ways in which games make money, advertising, and that can be advertising in the games. It can also be a way in which you provide a free-to-play game and the player can pay extra money uh, to watch an advertisement and they get rewards for that. And then there are also events now occurring within games, so that's also drawing money as well. Who is playing? Uh, it's changed over the years, but the demographics are about 30 to 35 years old, and it can be a female just as much as a male, though the males definitely have a greater percentage. 
However, in certain countries, females may have a greater percentage, and it may also be on a particular device. So Japan's a very good example. Two out of three players are females, probably because the mobile device is the main form in which people are actually playing the game. So playing a game can be as simple as if you're on a subway and you want to play a quick five-minute poker game, or it can be a very complex game that takes hundreds of hours that you're playing on a console. And so more than 2.7 billion active gamers, and that number kind of blows me away. But again, it's because of the mobile device. And this is a breakdown of the revenue from the different platforms. Mobile dominates, and mobile consists of smartphones and tablets. Second is console at 45.2 billion, and that includes not only the retail, but it also includes now digital, and that's become a very big thing uh, for the, the for the console platforms. And then thirdly is PC digital downloads. Uh, area dominated by Valve and Steam. So having said all that, the numbers are incredible. There are issues, obviously, like any other industry with the revenue that's being brought in and the competition. So it's a crowded market. You'll see that in digital, you'll see that in mobile. And the reason why it's crowded is because it's relatively easy to get uh, a game on particular platforms. And the barriers of entry are almost non-existent. You get a game. Some of them approve the games. Very simple compared to console approval. You press a button. You probably don't know what the contract means. You press a button, and all of a sudden, you can have distribution around the world. And that was unheard of years ago. And primarily, games were only sold at retail, which can be an extremely difficult process as well as an expensive process. And most likely unattainable by most companies. Uh, so crowded market, how do you get discovered? That's the biggest problem in my opinion. Secondly, uh, the market is dominated by a few games for various platforms, uh, retail, digital, and, and obviously that creates a problem because new games can't break in. It's also very expensive to back a new IP. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why licensing over the years has been successful. However, that is changing because uh, the major publishers are now focusing more on their own intellectual property because then that way they don't have to pay anyone. They have more control over it. And so that's what they are doing. Uh, many consumers on mobile actually don't pay to play the games. They free to play and that's a problem for developers. So they spend a lot of money trying to convince people who play for free to actually pay money, that can be a very expensive proposition. Uh, many independent developers, those are developers that aren't necessarily supported by publishers, providing them with finance. Uh, they don't make money back in the crowded market. Uh, development costs have increased, uh, especially for console games, where some games are costing uh, easily $100 million, and then plus you have marketing costs. But there are also games that are cheaper to make, mobile, for example, but even those games are becoming more expensive as it becomes a more competitive market. Uh, a changing legal landscape, uh, as money increases, people get more interested, whether it's the lawyers, whether it's the regulators, and you're seeing a lot more entrance and concern from legal people and regulators. And the key thing, obviously, to remind yourself is that Laws are different in different countries, which makes it a very difficult uh, navigation scheme for developers. So the first thing, and I'll probably quickly go through this because the themes are somewhat the same when it comes to mobile and digital. And what, as I mentioned previously, is that the barriers of entry have kind of come down because a game now can be played by consumers without them having to buy a retail copy. And a retail copy was very expensive. You had to manufacture, you had to get approval from the console manufacturers, which was a field dominated by Nintendo, Microsoft, uh, and Sony, uh, you had to pay X amount of dollars as a licensing fee, you had to get approved, you had to get this, the product in stores, stores may not pay you, they have policies on how they can return it, you have insurance, you have shipping, you have wholesale, it's difficult, and on top of all that, space is limited, and so as a result, if your game didn't do well, it didn't have much of a shelf life. So take that away and now you have digital and mobile where, you, like I said, you can click a button and, and pretty much get onto a platform. So you take away all those costs and now a developer is able to somewhat do it on their own 
However, it is a bit challenging to do it on your own because you got to market uh, your game. You got to somehow be discovered. You got to deal with financial issues. You got to deal with laws and regulations, which you may not know. So it is very challenging to go out there on your own, but there are obviously benefits. If you have a successful game, you're, you're keeping the revenue. You don't have to share it with anyone other than the platform holder who takes their fee. And you have tremendous freedom on what you can do. Uh, you can do nothing or you can do a lot of things. And as the owner of the intellectual property, you can create derivatives, so forth and so on, and, and don't necessarily have to share it with anyone. And so because the ability to enter into these markets has grown so much, it's opened up new markets. Uh, Middle East, Africa, China has exploded, and secondly, has expanded current markets. And one way in which those markets have expanded, not only are people now having access to games that they didn't necessarily have before, but also for video game companies, what's really great is that they don't really have that limitation of space anymore. And so they don't have to worry about an old game sitting on a shelf because if a consumer wants to play a game, he goes online, he finds the game on a particular platform, and it can be a game from 20 years ago. It can be Pac-Man. So the shelf life of games has expanded as a result of this digital library. And for many major publishers that have catalog library, it's been a massive success. And here are just some crazy numbers that you can see on the screen. 77.5 billion, including tablets in 2020, is projected for revenue from mobile devices. And you can also see the numbers in 2019, an estimated 61.7 billion was spent on gaming in the App Store and Google Play. And up until maybe very recently, where those companies didn't even make games, the amount of money was extraordinary, and they were some of the major players in the industry just because they had this incredible platform. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the barriers have dropped. This basically confirms what I said. The other advantage with mobile also is that they're different price points. So people can play for free, they can play pay for very little on a microtransaction. So there are a lot of options that a consumer can pursue, and that obviously seems very beneficial. And Challenges, similar to what I said, uh, few games dominate the market, uh, competing against a lot of games, bigger budgets, uh, different operating systems, new and evolving business models, a lot of regulatory issues, and consumers reluctant to, to pay. So you have the good and the bad, but if it's good, it's pretty amazing. And people are still bullish that the mobile market will potentially continue to grow. And the reasons why is because of new technology. Uh, 5G network will allow more consumers to access games, bigger games that their phone may not held. They can use the cloud. So a lot of advantages uh, potentially moving forward with mobile. And digital distribution uh, generated $45 billion in revenue for PC and console digital sales. It prolongs the life of games, access worldwide. Interesting, in 2011, digital accounted for 20% of the market with retail sales. And now it's been flipped eight years later, where the market now is 80% digital sales, 20% retail. And... Most publishers, if not all now, are reporting that their income is greater with digital than in retail. So an amazing change of events. And then PC, uh, digital was about $37 billion, dominated by Steam. And as I mentioned before, uh, the revenue from free-to-play games, they can sell content, power-ups, advertising, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about loot boxes, which is also one of the big regulatory issues recently. But these are ways in which uh, the video game developers are able to raise money on free-to-play games similar to mobile devices. And just to show you how big PC distribution is, dominated by Steam, over 1 billion registered accounts over 24 million active users, but over 30,000 games available, how do you find a game? It can be pretty difficult to do that. And because of the massive success of, of Stream, other companies have entered into the picture. We'll see if they can compete. Epic is probably the most prominent. They launched in 2018. And as you can see by the numbers, they're off to a very, very good start. And one of their hooks was that they were only going to take a 12% fee as compared to a 
30% fee that is taken by Valve. And that's a massive difference, especially for a developer. It can make or break whether their game is successful. There are other digital platforms as well. Some of the major video game publishers have their own, and they hope that fans would go to their site to play certain games. I don't know whether that's actually doing that as well as they would like. EA recently announced that they're actually going to put their games back on Steam because they realize Steam is such a big market that they need to compete uh, and be on that platform. And then consoles, the new consoles uh, have a big push towards digital. You can buy a console with or without uh, the ability to actually load a retail version to the game. And you're seeing digital maybe represent 50% of sales for the new, for the previous platforms as well as the new platforms. And I'll just talk real quickly about the new launches. So PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X launched in November, off to their most successful starts. Uh, Sony hasn't announced the numbers, but it, they did report that it exceeded the numbers for PlayStation 4, which at the time was a record. So after just two weeks, they've sold about 2.1 million uh, machines, which is a pretty good number. And why the success? Well, life cycles for video game consoles usually are six to seven years. And what we've seen is people anxiously awaiting the new consoles because of the, the new technology, new innovations, a better gameplay. And that is why it's been successful. 95, when PlayStation was released, it sold 100,000 units in the first weekend and sold a million units in six months, breaking all sales records. And now you can see what the numbers are like uh, as of eh, probably about a month ago, PlayStation 4, 113 million. So even though the new platforms have come out, developers will continue to develop for the previous platforms because there's such an installed base and, and the people aren't necessarily going to go out and buy the new console. So also cloud gaming where the game sits on a remote server instead of on the computer it will allow people to actually play these very detailed games on their mobile device because they're accessing the game on a cloud server and so that perhaps will expand opportunities. A number of companies have gotten their feet wet in this particular area. We'll wait and see whether it's going to be successful. And then there's also cross-platform compatibility where I can own a PlayStation and, and play that game with a friend who may be playing on an Xbox, so forth and so on. So those are some kind of neat things. And then uh, also a big change is the, as I mentioned before, is the uh, Independent developers, there are a lot of them. They're not necessarily relying on publishers anymore to help them distribute their game. And that's mainly because the entry years of Varia have been reduced. So let's uh, jump to recent legal and regulatory issues. And some of these issues are going to be discussed in other conferences, but these are now some of the things that the video game industry is dealing with. Rights of privacy and the collection of data, obviously very significant. And the main reason is because video game companies tend to collect data. A, they think they can fix their games based on consumer reaction, which they do, but also they can identify perhaps consumers on what they would like, and maybe they can target them with certain items that eventually they will purchase. So this free-to-play model basically resulted in greater concerns about privacy because the video game companies are trying to attract more consumers that play pay to free and understand their background a little better. And there have been a host of regulations, the GTPR, which you will know, should know about in Europe. Uh, the United States, they, do, they have COPA, which deals with children. China has regulatory, as many other com countries do as well. And then California has the 2020 Consumers Privacy Act, probably the most restrictive in the United States. The United States doesn't have a national privacy law or legislation, so each state takes it upon themselves to, to regulate this particular area, and it varies quite a bit from state to state. Some have very little, some have a lot more, such as California. And then on top of that, Proposition 24, which was passed by voters is actually going to even be more restrictive when it comes to privacy, where initially the burden was on the consumer to 
tell a business that they don't want their information shared, so forth and so on. And now the burden shifts to the business to somewhat take a more active role in controlling the amount of data. So we'll wait to see what happens with that, but that's something that people need to be aware of. And of course, as the technology gets better, there are going to be new issues with intellectual property, copyright, trademarks, and that's because the artwork has gotten so amazing is that you can now see things that perhaps you could not see previously. And quickly go over one popular area, and that's actually tattoos. And many people will think, wow, that's really crazy. Tattoos, video games, copyright issues. And what has happened is, is that the artist uh, inked a tattoo on athletes or other entertainers, and then these athletes appeared in video games, and these companies and these artists said, hey, wait a second, I didn't give you the rights for that. And the problem is, is that no one signed contracts. No one probably ever even thought this could even potentially be an issue. So because no contracts were signed, you now have this problem. Was a license granted even though there's no paperwork? And so there's been a bunch of uh, legal action during the last few years, but no court ever made a decision because those cases were all settled out of court. And then finally, there was a case where a company that actually purchased the rights to artwork created by tattoo artists, they sued the developer of the game and a number of other parties. This is a picture of LeBron James in real life with the Lakers. And then on the right, you see, at least my right, you see him when he played for the Cavaliers and as it appears in the game, and you can see the tattoos and they sued for copyright infringement. And first issue is, can a tattoo be copyrighted? I think that's pretty clear that it can be copyrighted. Uh, but then you get into a whole bunch of other issues. Who controls that copyright, especially if no agreement has been signed? And the court ruled, this particular court ruled, that there was no copyright infringement. And they basically focused on three areas. One, it was de minimis use. Uh, and this is United States law. So the use was so minimal. You had a lot of players in the game. Many of them didn't have tattoos. Very few had them. It was very hard to see the tattoo. Consumers were in purchasing the game because of the tattoo. And therefore, not a big deal, basically. Uh, the other thing was a, a fair use argument, which is in the United, unique to the United States, that uh, it's a defense that I'm allowed to use this intellectual property even though I haven't signed an agreement, but because of the various reasons under fair use, I'm entitled to use it. And the court agreed in this particular case that it was a, a, a good fair use argument. And thirdly, it was an implied contract, no written contract. And they ba said based on the specific actions taken by the parties, it was implied that this could be a possible use of the tattoo. So in this particular case, the developers won. However, that's in contrast to a recent case pending in Illinois, another court, other jurisdiction, dealing with the same issue, tattoos that were inked on this particular wrestler named Randy Orton. Take-Two again is involved. Take-Two again used the same arguments that they used in the previous case. And yet this particular court said, no, we're not going to dismiss the case. And a motion was made for summary judgment, which is basically there's no controversy regarding the facts and just based on the law, one side wins. And the judge said in this particular case that there are facts that are potentially disputable. And so therefore, let me just go back to that. So therefore, it's not, I'm not going to get rid of this particular case and it's going to proceed to the next round. They they rejected the fair use argument, saying that there wasn't enough there to justify that as a defense at this time. Secondly, they said we don't have enough information about uh, what was discussed between the parties, so therefore we can't reach a conclusion on whether this was an implied uh, contract or not. And so we're going to go to the next round and see what happens. And it would be kind of interesting if, in fact, this court ruled differently and there are a number of other tattoo cases pending. So I'm also going to jump to trademark cases. And the reason why I like to talk about this is because I think we're seeing courts acknowledge, at least in the United States, a more expansive role of developers in the same vein as movies and books, providing additional First Amendment protection for developers. And as a result, there is more trademarks being incorporated that didn't necessarily obtain a license 
Uh, the courts have adopted primarily what's called the Rogers test. And under the Rogers test, real simple, two-pronged test. One, is there artistic relevance on why the developer used a particular trademark? And if there is artistic relevance. You go to prong two, which is basically, is there consumer confusion? Does the consumer think that the owners of those trademarks had anything to do with the game, that they sponsored it or endorsed it in any way? And that's primarily the test that has been used. This was a textbook case involving Grand Theft Auto, uh, Playpen and Pigpen. It was a dancing club. I'll be nice and call it a dancing club. And they incorporated it into the game. And the court ruled that there was artistic relevance because it was showcasing the LA night scene. And secondly, they felt that there was really no consumer confusion. It wasn't seen that much in the game. Now, that's in contrast to another case involving electronics arts where they put a bunch of helicopters into their game. And in this particular case, uh, they settled out of court, but the court definitely was hinting that this could be a problem because the helicopters were very prominent. So it had artistic relevance, but because of the prominence of the helicopters, it appeared that perhaps they did have a relationship in the development of this game. And that gets me to a decision that was reached a few months ago involving Activision, Call of Duty series, one of the most successful series in the world. And they were capturing the war in Iraq. They had used a number of Humvee vehicles in their game without a license. And they kind of adopted it more than the pig pen situation, uh, maybe the same as the helicopters. And so the vehicles appeared in games varying in duration, ranging from brief appearances in the background and being mentioned in dialogue to players. Uh, riding in them for a few minutes, which you know, may be borderline. And the court actually ruled that it was protected under fair use under the First Amendment, clearly relevant when you're capturing the Iraqi war, and the game is about the Iraqi war. And this was kind of interesting. The court said that even though there may be some confusion, it was not enough uh, that would justify finding Activision in violation of intellectual property rights. So that's an interesting case in my opinion. We'll probably see more like that. It was probably an important case for Activision because they want to get some type of an answer on these type of issues because it is a very gray area, but protected by the First Amendment. Uh, I want to touch upon another big issue, and it's gambling, and it ties back into what's called loot boxes. And again, this is a way in which the Developers are trying to raise revenue for their games, especially if it's a free-to-play game. So they create these mechanisms which the consumer can pay for, whether in real money or in game currency, and they win prizes. But they don't know what prize they're actually going to win, and that's what's caused the problem. And many governments or uh, governmental bodies believe that is a form of gambling in the United States, for example, chance, you don't know what you're going to win. It's random uh, consideration. You're paying a certain amount of money and you get a prize, uh, but you don't know what you're going to get. And people have spent thousands of dollars on these loot boxes to get hopefully something that is somewhat unique. And so Europe, the United States and other countries have looked at this and said that there could be potentially a problem. The Netherlands and Belgium have said that this is a problem. It is gambling, especially they're concerned about kids perhaps playing. And just recently, a court in the Netherlands upheld a 10 uh, million euro 10 million, 10 euro, million, yeah, 10 million dollar, I shouldn't say dollar, 10 million euro fine against EA for incorporating loot boxes in their game. And other countries such as Poland, they've decided that it's not a form of gambling. And other com countries have reacted by saying that you have to put at least provide what are the statistics if, if someone was to try to win a prize, what are the odds? And the United States, China have adopted something like that. You know, many of the publishers saying that they will put odds or the random odds on boxes. And when you play, you'll know what perhaps you're going to get. In the United States, different states have approached this a little differently. Some think it's gambling, some don't think it's gambling. So we have to wait and see what's going to happen with that. So that's gonna be a big issue. And then we're gonna to jump to 
Uh, a big issue right now is antitrust and anti-competitive issues involving Apple and Google. So Epic, the makers of Fortnite, their game is distributed on these platforms and they oppose the fact that they have to pay a 30% fee uh, regarding any form of revenue that's earned on these platforms. So Apple and Google take their 30% and then the remaining amount of money goes to the developers or the publishers. And Epic thought that this was an outrageous amount of money, that they're not entitled to this particular fee. And what many say is very significant is that Apple and Google take a 30% fee, but that's somewhat standard in the industry. So the console manufacturers take a 30% fee and Valve takes a 30% fee, although Epic tried to distinguish those from Apple and Google, claiming that they have greater investments, so forth and so on. So it could potentially be a big case uh, and whether... Uh, that 30% fee is anti-competitive. The big thing is going to be when the court looks at this, well, what is the market? Uh, does Epic have the opportunity to distribute their game in other markets and the consumer is not being affected by that? So it's the market focus that you're looking at. You're also looking, how does it affect the consumer? Is Apple and Google's position anti-competitive where the consumer has to pay artificially higher prices for obtaining services or product. And, and that is probably going to be the big question regarding this lawsuit. And then people are looking out for what are the ramifications going to be uh, with this particular case? Will it affect other forms of distribution? So a lot of eyes regarding this uh, particular case. Interesting enough, Apple just announced, I think two weeks ago, that they are reducing the fee that they're taking for all apps on their store, but it only applies for uh, developers who make less than $1 million a year. Uh, the fee, I believe, drops to 15%, and probably that type of developer makes up most of the pie when dealing with Apple. Uh, the big video game publishers obviously far exceed that amount, so they would still be required to pay a so-called 30% licensing fee. So that's on the horizon, and... And so it gives me about 14 minutes to talk a little about streaming. And this has been around, but it's it's definitely grown over the last years, last few years. And what does streaming actually involve? And quite simply, it's people watching other people play games. No different than if I was to watch a football game, whether American or European soccer, and I'm um, enjoying watching it, and I enjoy maybe the commentators, or admittedly, and this is what streamers may do as well, they turn off the volume and put their own music on in the background. So there are different forms of streaming. It's live streaming. So for example, I'm playing a game right now, and it's live, and you're watching me play the game, which would probably be one of the bigger mistakes in your life, because it would be just beyond belief boring, and I probably would even know how to start the game. And alternatively, there's also video on demand. And what that means is that the games have been played already and they're basically, you're watching uh, a taped broadcast of the game. Uh, you can look up something. These are recorded uh, streaming games and they may be edited. So the numbers, again, incredibly impressive. 740 million viewers, 15,000 games streamed, too many. That creates a big problem. High percentage of people watching the top games, again, just like buying games, the top games dominate the market. One report, five games represented 50% uh, of the game stream. And the, assume that these numbers have skyrocketed during the coronavirus as more people stay home. Uh, the audience, typically male, 18 to 34, but has attracted very young audiences, as young as seven. Uh, the 10 to 12 category, the amount of people that play games in that category, it's about over 70% will actually watch games being streamed. And for kids who are seven years old or so who, act, who play games, the percentage is about 60%. So an incredibly high number. People want to target those people because, A, if you get them to play games, they'll probably enjoy games for the rest of their life. 
life if they have a good experience. And a lot of these people are playing games in lieu of other forms of entertainment, whether that be watching movies or even sports. And that's why sports world is a little nervous about video games and they're trying to get more involved in the video game culture. And one very cool thing about streaming and people watching games is it's the community. And so it's really great for gamers to be able to talk with the people that are playing the games, uh, comment and watch them. And that's something I don't think you necessarily get in other forms of entertainment. Maybe in book clubs you get it, people sit around the table and they talk about a book. But when you have thousands of people or hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of people watching someone stream a game, that's pretty impressive. So how are games watched? There's some live play, which is the most popular. If someone's playing a game, they comment on, on it, and they watch it. There's something called speed running, where you just play part of the game and you try to get to the end as fast as possible. So there's an audience for that. Esports, which is competitive gaming, and that will be talked about quite a bit in another session. Uh, that has grown. That has become a billion-dollar industry. And then recorded videos. And why do consumers like even watching people play games? Well, in many ways, no different than when you watch sports. You learn the skills, although admittedly, when you play a game, you can probably get those skills a lot easier than if I'm watching a baseball game. There's no way that I can hit a fastball at 95 miles an hour, no matter how much I watch baseball or kick a ball uh, cross field. And I can watch it for endless hours. I'm never going to be able to do it. Whereas a game player can probably learn those skills. Uh, great social interaction with fans, very important during the coronavirus. Uh, watching professional players, the entertainment value, some, and some of the streamers are very funny and uh, they also entertain by showing you how to play the game and listening to their commentary. So those are the main reasons why people watch. Different reasons, however, for a developer or a publisher because they obviously want people to watch so they can grow their audience. So who are the players in this interesting field? The platforms. Uh, so Twitch, for example, owned by Amazon, 70% of the market they dominate. So person wants to watch games, watch people play games, they go onto these particular platforms, Twitch being the leader. Acquired for a billion dollars in 1994 by Amazon, and many people thought that was crazy. Now it's looking like it's a pretty good deal. Uh, in 2019, 9.3 billion hours watched on Twitch mind-boggling. YouTube gaming falls in second at 21%. It's a big drop. However, 250 million people watching games every day on YouTube. And then there's Facebook gaming at 3%, obviously trying to grow their market. So those are the platforms where you can watch the games. The content owners, of course, very important. They own the intellectual property. They can tell you what you can see, what you can't see. They enter, people enter into terms of service agreements, which allows them to use the IP and also restricts them, how they can use it, number of reasons why a developer perhaps would want to restrict it. One reason could be they may not have the underlying rights for streaming purposes, so they have to be careful about that. Two, they may not want all the content in the game being shown. Maybe they would like the consumer to find out about these things or to experience it, and therefore they want to limit the rights. Three, they may limit it because someone who signs the terms of use may engage in conduct that is unacceptable, perhaps language they don't like, and therefore they want to eliminate them from actually streaming. And so they have to have a balance, the developer, because in one way they want the streamers to engage in their games, promote their games, and this is probably the second best way in which games are sold, friends being the number one way in which people learn about games. So this is the second way. So they want to continually support this, but at the same line, at the same time, it's a gray area because they actually also have to protect their intellectual property. And uh, the other important thing for developers for esports, unlike other sports where someone can just pick up a football and to toss it, they can form a league if they want, the rules are open to everyone as long as they have equipment. Esports is very different. Esports can only occur with the content being provided by the developers. So you have a few esports games that dominate the market. There are a lot of games that are played competitively and also by amateurs. But you can't do that unless the developer is approving the use of that content for that particular game. So they have a lot of control. 
the, another party and very, very important is, are the streamers. Those are the ones who play the games, provide commentary. You can have streamers that are incredibly talented with these games. And then you can have someone like me. I could stream tomorrow if I wanted to. Again, it would be a waste of everyone's time other than for laughs. And some of these streamers can draw up to 5 million people, at least the top five. So incredible numbers that will follow these particular games. And they are sought by the platforms. Twitch wants to have these popular streamers because they draw in a big crowd. And publishers also want them because they want them to talk about their game. Great publicity. And many ways, streaming is a marketing tool. Esports, in many ways, is a marketing tool for many companies getting out there in front of the public. Uh, and some streamers make millions of dollars. They make it either they get money, an exclusive deal from the platform. Maybe they get some money from a publisher, although that's a fine line as well on how much, you know, somewhat like an influencer. And there was a discussion about that. So you have to be careful. And then they get it from subscriptions where people pay a certain amount of money to watch this particular person. Uh, provide additional content, perhaps, so forth and so on. And, and then they get money, perhaps, through advertising. But they need to follow the terms of use uh, that can be very strict for some companies and not so strict for others. And one of the problems is you have a 13-year-old who says, hey, I play this game, I want to stream, and all of a sudden they're streaming. They don't know what the intellectual property issues are. They don't really even know probably what the agreement sign, uh, and they just click a button, so that's a problem. And then, of course, they're the eSports athletes, and like I said, that will be talked about at a later uh, discussion. So the streamers provide tremendous publicity and marketing value. And this is some information about uh, esports. The, the takeaways for esports, at least when it comes to numbers, prize money was $3 million in 2010. It's now $100 million, which is impressive. Some of these athletes are making millions of dollars in salaries. And Syracuse University, located in New York in the United States, claims that by 2021, esports audiences will surpass viewership of American sports, except for American football. And baseball and basketball probably get over 60 million viewers. So those are big numbers. I don't know if that's going to happen. I'll be very curious. But just the fact that they're close to something like that is really, really impressive. I think esports is they're looking at numbers about 80 million. The NFL is over 100 million. So uh, that there's still a way to go. But again, incredible numbers uh, involved with streaming. So we have two or three minutes. So talk about some of the intellectual property issues regarding streaming. And as streaming becomes more popular, it has drawn the attention of many people, whether that's lawyers or content holders. And so what has happened is, is that A, the Developers or the publishers obviously control the use of their intellectual property, and they do that through a terms of use agreement, and they have to monitor that quite a bit. Difficult area to monitor because you don't necessarily want to take away certain rights from streamers because all of a sudden that news gets out in that closed community. And so you have to be careful. Is it is it worth accepting the fact that someone's using my intellectual property? Probably not the way I want them to use it, but I'm not going to bark about it for right now. Um, difficult to deal with and some people will say well the cat's out of the you know, cat's out of the hat i don't know what the expression is but the video game companies accept, uh, originally accepted the fact that people would stream and they thought it was a very positive thing which is is but how much can they draw back from this so it's a difficult area and the bigger issue recently has been music and what has happened is is that streamers are using music that they have not licensed it's perhaps playing in the background of a particular game and so the music labels publishers have gone after a number of streamers as well as twitch uh, and required them to take it down claiming copyright infringement and that could potentially be a big issue for Twitch. Now, on the other hand, uh, Google has licensing fees that they pay for the music rights. What will Twitch do? Some of the solutions have been they mute the music, they have a library of music that they've obtained the rights for, or they license the rights. And so we'll see what happens. And with the music industry wanting to get as much money as they can because of the virus, this is potentially one way to do it. And it would appear if their music has 
been, is being used without a license, then they have what I would assume would be a very legitimate complaint regarding the music. So I'm running out of time. I don't want to be muted. So uh, thank you. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I tried to cover <laughs> a lot of crown in a very short period of time. I'll go back to you. Well, thank you very much, David. It was a very good talk. I think it was to be complete. I think you developed all the video game issues, the industry issues. So we're very grateful. We thank everyone for your participation. Remember that tomorrow we're going to be listening to Amona's uh, video game. And for those of you who haven't uh, registered, you can contact me and we would like to thank you for your participation and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.